Welcome to Voices of Fitness and Bodybuilding, Episode 11. I'm not sure how you are listening to this podcast, how you get it, but I want to be sure that you know that you can get VOFNB several different ways. By subscribing on iTunes or using your podcast app on your phone, it will download automatically when we upload a new episode. You can find us on SoundCloud or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. You'll get an email whenever I post new videos of any kind. So there's no excuse not to have voices wherever you go. I listen to podcasts all the time. I mean, I'm really hooked, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to make one. So before we begin, I want to hip you to a few podcasts that I really love. One of them is The Smartest Man in the World with Greg Proops. Uh, you might know him from the TV show Whose Line Is It Anyway? He's a great improviser and a really funny guy, and it gets very political sometimes, but it's always with a lot of wit and humor. There's something called The Savage Lovecast, which is a sex and relationship advice podcast with Dan Savage, who rose to notoriety as a famously homosexual man giving advice on sex and relationships to heterosexual couples. I mean, that's kind of his shtick, but it goes way beyond that, and he really gets in-depth into a lot of great uh, relationship and sexual issues that can apply to anyone. There's something called The Way I Heard It, with Mike Rowe. He's the guy from that uh, TV show Dirty Jobs. And he does these short stories. They're only about six or seven minutes long. And they're usually about famous or infamous people. And they don't tell you who it is at first. And you kind of have to figure it out as you go along. And there's a surprise reveal at the end. They're very entertaining and very informative. There's Lightspeed Magazine, which is a sci-fi and fantasy short story podcast. That's a great one. Edumacation with filmmaker Kevin Smith, who did Clerks and Chasing Amy and a bunch of other movies. Uh, he's hilarious, but he's always being educated by the comedy writer Andy McElfresh, who used to work on The Tonight Show, but is also a really intelligent guy. So Andy gathers, so kind of like what I do, but he gathers stuff from all over the world of, of science and kind of presents it to Kevin while Kevin goofs on it most of the time. But it's really funny and, again, informative. So anyway, this week on this podcast, in the fitness section, we give you five good reasons to continue to do that which most people detest, steady state cardio. I know it's boring, but it's also important if you want to lose fat. For you bodybuilders and lifters and really anyone who likes to work out, the five people you need to avoid in the gym. Frankly, I can think of more than five. Then Dave Pulsanella stops by. We talk about my recent move and the murder on my block. Dave adds to the list of the most detestable people in the gym, and yet we still try to end on a positive and inspiring note. And finally, for the off-topic section, we talk about physical attraction. What factors make that elusive thing called chemistry? We find out that it may be even more about actual chemicals than we realize. Now, I know that in a previous episode, I read from a couple of articles praising HIT or high intensity interval training. But I'm about to read an article from the other side of the cardio debate so called steady state cardio, the bane of most people's existence. We see this kind of thing in the fitness industry all the time the back and forth debate between different training disciplines. But this article isn't a so-and-so is better than kind of article, because really there are many ways to get your cardio, and for me personally, I like to mix it up between hit and steady state. But good, solid, steady state cardio does have its place. And if you want a little encouragement, here are five good reasons to keep doing it. This article comes from bodybuilding.com, and it's called Going Steady. Five Reasons to Do Steady State Cardio by Shannon Clark, posted April 13th, 2015. If you've done any recent reading on cardio training, you've likely come to one solid conclusion. To shed pounds fast, High Intensity Interval Training, HIIT, is freaking awesome. Fast-paced bursts of all-out cardio punctuated by short rest intervals have been touted as a key for fat loss, and for good reason. HIT burns more calories than low-intensity cardio per session. It also places greater recovery demands on your body, which causes you to burn more calories after training than you would in a standard hour-long treadmill session. 
Plus, HIT may actually increase testosterone levels. It can also boost GLUT4 concentration, which helps drive glucose into the cells. In addition, according to the American College of Sports Medicine, just two weeks of high-intensity intervals improves your aerobic capacity as much as six to eight weeks of treadmill jogging. Pretty darn impressive, right? So knowing all this, you've probably set out on a mission to do nothing but strength training and HIIT workouts. After all, you're looking to keep fat levels at a minimum while building lean muscle. But is this really the route to go? Is high-intensity training always the best type of cardio? Take a moment to consider adding steady-state cardio to your training. Slow and steady might not win the race, but it definitely has a place along the way. Here's what steady-state cardio will do for you. 1. You will recover faster. If you've allotted yourself an hour of daily gym time and consistently train hard, you might be forgetting one essential part of the equation, recovery. The effects of a workout don't stop once you leave the gym, and that feeling of fatigue might not either. Sure, interval training allows you to complete a full cardio workout in less time, but it taxes your central nervous system to a high extent. If you couple HIT with a number of other strength training workouts throughout the week, you won't spur recovery you might actually impede recovery. If you're already using up most of your resources for strength training, you won't have much gas left in the tank to successfully complete multiple interval workouts. Chances are, you'll just be digging yourself deeper into the recovery hole and making it harder to get out. Moderation is the key. Coupling strength workouts with three days of high-intensity interval training every week could tap you out. In this case, the enhanced recovery you'd see with steady-state cardio training surpasses any potential fitness gains you'd get by doing more sprint work. Try low to moderate intensity workouts to help increase blood flow to damaged muscles and boost your recovery. 2. You will maintain muscle mass. Normally, sprint training as opposed to moderately intense endurance work, is actually better for retaining lean muscle. Basically, it provides a stressor on the muscle that mimics weightlifting more than distance running does. However, there are exceptions. If you couple an intense low-calorie diet with numerous strength training and sprint workouts each week, you'll actually risk muscle mass loss. Poor recovery and poor nutrition spell trouble. The harder you work out, the more glycogen you burn, which can leave you extremely hungry post-workout. Moderate intensity, steady state cardio doesn't take as large a toll on your body as a HIIT session, which can make dieting easier and increase your calorie burn without overstressing your system. Three, you will burn calories. If you're someone who leads a relatively sedentary lifestyle and typically goes from sitting at a desk to sitting on your couch, Adding in some form of daily cardio is a wise move, but you might not be ready for HIT. It's okay to scale things down, and yes, you'll still see results. While you won't get the same post-workout calorie burn from moderate intensity steady-state cardio as you would from a good interval sprint session, you'll still burn a decent number of calories, and they do add up. 30 minutes of jogging can burn approximately 300 calories. Do that five days a week, and you could lose almost two extra pounds per month. Four, you'll build up your aerobic fitness. Steady state cardio brings more benefits than weight loss. It's great for developing your aerobic fitness level and increasing your cardiovascular endurance. The benefits of steady state cardio are functional and translate to real life. If you participate in weekend adventure activities like hiking, cycling, or rowing, Cardiovascular endurance is essential. And five, you'll stick with it. Sometimes a fitness plan comes down to one simple question. Are you going to stick with it? While interval training might be the superior cardio modality for fat loss, if you absolutely hate sprint training, what good does it do you? Are you honestly going to keep up with your workouts if you dread doing them? First and foremost, remember the key role of enjoyment in exercise. The less you fear, or better yet, look forward to your daily sweat session, the more likely you are to make it routine. This isn't to say you should never do an exercise that doesn't top your list of favorites, 
But if you despise every second of a training session and there are alternative options, consider switching things up. That reminds me of something my brother always used to say when asked, you know, and my brother's a, a personal trainer, my brother Dave, when asked what is the best uh, cardio piece of cardio equipment, you know, the treadmill or the bicycle or, or whatever, recumbent bike, his answer would always be the one that you'll use because it's more important that you get on the damn thing on a regular basis rather than, you know, which one is physically going to burn more calories per minute. Now, I really enjoy my hit cardio. I probably only do it once a week, but I like the steady state too. And I would add a few more good reasons to do it. And this is all about creating the proper positive mindset, which will help you reach your goals. First, you can look at it, look at steady state time spent on a bicycle or, 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 or a treadmill or whatever as a special alone time for you. You get away from everything, from everyone, you know, put your earbuds in and just get away. And this is your time. I look at it that way. I mean, it can be a kind of meditative time for me, or you can use the time to learn or be entertained. You know, like we talked about earlier, I, I love playing podcasts, and many of the podcasts that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I listen to. It's a way of feeling like I'm being really productive, you know, losing fat, strengthening my heart, and enriching my brain all at the same time. So don't be the kind of person who says, I hate cardio, because it needs to be done. So that mindset just doesn't help you. Instead, find reasons to love cardio and, and say it out loud. I love my cardio because, and you will find yourself moving more easily toward your fitness goals. To illustrate that point a little better, here's an audio excerpt from a video I made with my brother Dave about the mindset for success. I mean, I just really like the way he puts things into words. He's always been very good at crystallizing thoughts into memorable words. The video is called The Mindset of Failure, and the full video can be found on my Mike Polsonelli YouTube channel, along with many others. I had a girl who called all the foods on her plan nasty ass. So what'd you eat today? I ate nasty ass tuna, I ate nasty ass eggs, I ate nasty ass bread, and I ate nasty ass uh, turkey, I ate nasty ass. Now how in the world is she supposed to succeed? when she called all the things that she was eating nasty ass. And it didn't matter. If I put it on her plan, she would call it nasty ass because it was something she had to eat. Even if it was something she liked and I put it on her plan. <laughs> nasty ass cupcakes, nasty ass pizza. I'm like, wait, you like those things. But once it was something she had to eat on the piece of paper, it became nasty ass. Now you tell me, how is that person going to succeed as long as they're representing what they have to do all day, every day as nasty ass? And the same with car, I hate cardio. Man, I hate cardio. Boy, I have to do my cardio, I hate cardio. How are you gonna say those words to yourself all the time when you have to do an hour and a half of cardio every day? Why would you do that to yourself? If you know for the next 20 weeks you have to do an hour of cardio every day, why would you represent that cardio to yourself as being a pain in the ass and being nasty and being horrible and being draconian and being all these other things? when you could just as easily say, I love the way cardio makes me feel. When I get off the machine, I feel like I accomplished something. I feel like my day is just starting. I started it off right, and I know I burned a few fat cells, and I feel like a little closer to my goal. Why wouldn't you do that? The title of this next article is The Five People Every Lifter Needs to Avoid. It's by Danny Shugart, and it's posted on tnation.com. But I really think this is more universal. I think it applies not only to everyone who goes to the gym, but just to life in general. You'll see what I mean. There are certain people we should avoid, and others we need to have around us, and I, I think Danny nails it here. The article was posted in September of 2015, and the full title is, The Five People Every Lifter Needs to Avoid, Plus five awesome people you need in your life. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That's what they say. If that's true, then avoid these guys if you want to make progress in the gym or in your sport. 1. The Joy Killer The best kind of criticism is motivating. It makes you think, alright, I'm going to try that again, but better this time. You need it to learn and grow. But that's not what we're talking about here. 
We're talking about personal jabs and remarks that make you more disheartened than amped up about what you're trying to achieve. Weight training, competition prep, dietary improvements, these are examples of things that should make you feel good about your life and yourself. So if a coach or a friend who's in a power position makes you think you're crap when you're earnestly seeking to improve, then find a new one. There are more trainers and coaches now than ever before, and you can easily find one whose training style matches your learning style. Cattiness has no place in fitness. And if someone you're casually training with makes you feel inadequate, cut them out. Be fearless. Burn that bridge. Leave the touchy-feely hug-it-outs for life coaches and Oprah wannabes. Have enough respect for yourself to say, you're fired. 2. The Dogmatic Expert This guy makes people feel stupid if they don't adamantly agree with his particular diet or workout beliefs. He often doesn't acknowledge the intricacies involved in human biology, so he oversimplifies the science, then uses condescending humor to make others feel obligated to agree. Or he'll use a series of multisyllabic words to try and speak over people's heads, even though what he's saying doesn't make any damn sense. Communicating isn't important to him. Showing off is. These guys don't want to admit that some things work for some people and other things work for other people, and they certainly don't believe in letting any of us think for ourselves in order to sort that out. A lot of people kowtow to these characters because they think this kind of egotism is a sign of knowing a lot of information. If you're ever tempted to join their brigade, think of how David Foster Wallace describes blind certainty. Quote, a closed-mindedness that amounts to an imprisonment so total that the prisoner doesn't even know he's locked up. End quote. Well, don't be blindly certain about anything fitness-related. Open your eyes and see firsthand what works for you, and then you won't have to worry about the people regurgitating their dogma all over your brain. 3. The Outdated Expert There are lifters who don't do a lot of reading online, or anywhere else for that matter, and that's no big deal, unless they're coaching people. No studies, no books, no articles, no exposure to instruction, no new ideas. They use the same stale info passed down from a former coach and expect others to thrive on the same script they followed. When it comes to diet, they sure as heck don't read any books that dig into some of the psychological or biological issues that cause people to overeat or undereat. In their minds, all you have to do is consume exactly what's on their meal plan and go through the motions of exactly what's listed in their workouts. They'll sell all of this to you for $1,000, of course. To them, the thing that matters most is that you get better looking on their watch. They want you to become their trophy, or at least make for a nice before and after on their website. They aren't setting you up for long-term health, leanness, and sanity. They're unwittingly setting you up to crash hard once you're done with them. So what's the answer? Read voraciously. Protect yourself by becoming your own best expert. Commit to different dietary approaches and try different styles of training without becoming a zealot for any one of them. Learned helplessness isn't cool, and there's an easy way to combat it. Gather as much information as you can, whenever you can, and figure out how it applies to you. 4. The Public Speaker This isn't the kind that gets paid to talk. Nor is this the person who likes to be outgoing at the gym. No, these people simply have diarrhea of the mouth, and they aren't sensitive to social cues. So they'll tell you about themselves, regardless of whether or not you're slowly turning your body to a different direction or taking steps backwards. Don't be a doormat. If you're learning too much information about a complete stranger, get blunt. There was a public speaker at my former gym who would stop me in the women's locker room and hold me captive before workouts. I didn't want to be rude, so I let it continue till I got to the point where I was learning about laser therapy for wrinkles and prescription vaginal cream for menopause. People like this aren't interested in conversation. They're interested in being heard. That's not necessarily a job you need to take on right before workouts, and certainly not during. 5 anti-people. 
they're angry at the world. Like the dogmatic expert, they're not okay with anyone training differently than them or eating differently than them because their fitness is their religion. They flaunt their superiority, ironically, by bashing people who are often very successful and happy with their own diet and exercise. CrossFit's haters, for instance, are becoming more of a stereotype than the people who actually train in CrossFit facilities. Granted, anyone who identifies as their diet or their workout program will be annoying. Talk to any googly-eyed noob who started a diet or workout plan and you'll know just how that works. They always become easier to relate to as their fitness becomes routine. Experience softens overzealousness, and I actually have yet to see any overzealousness at the CrossFit gym where I often work out. What I have seen is a lot of guys at commercial gyms wearing what looks like a bodybuilding uniform talking about their upcoming bodybuilding competitions. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Just realize every subgroup has its own walking cliche. Not all people who attend CrossFit workouts walk around in knee-high socks and neon clothing. And those who do probably have more important things on their mind than hating someone else for their training of choice. Five awesome people every lifter needs. Outperform yourself, continue making gains, and actually enjoy the process. And do it with the help of these guys. 1. The Specialist To learn a thing, you must specialize in it momentarily. You won't automatically be proficient at powerlifting, kettlebell swinging, or posing like a bodybuilder if nobody has shown you how. You can't master anything without feedback from a master. That's where the specialist comes in. They correct your mistakes, program your workouts, and help you become more efficient in a style of moving iron. Having one is obviously more necessary for those first starting out in any form of lifting, but even world-class coaches look to other coaches, and even experienced lifters will switch training styles to try something new. 2. The Influencer this is the person who plants ideas, like seeds, that slowly grow into bigger goals and belief systems. They give you direction and answer questions you didn't even know you had. Sometimes they show you that what you've been striving for is actually not worth your time. You don't need to see these people every day, or even in person, to benefit from their influence. They're simply a voice of reason that helps you cut through trivial junk to grow towards bigger endeavors. On occasion, the influencer will make you mad because you don't want what he or she says to be true. But we need to hear those opposing views. Why? Because you learn nothing by surrounding yourself with people who always agree with you. If you're not faced with opposing information, you'll end up doing the same old workouts, striving for the same old goals, or eating the same old diet, things which may have worked at one point, but stopped serving you a long time ago. Without even trying, Influencers can redirect your energy where it matters. Because of them, you get to the bottom of things, like why you even work out, what actually matters in the big scheme of things, what your next steps should be, and what performance, longevity, and strength really mean to you. Influencers are your best bet for getting a serious wake-up call. If you don't have one, or two, right now, start looking. 3. The Bro Everyone should have one at some point. Guys have their bros. Girls have their lady bros. They're like an energy drink in human form. Spend a minute with him or her and you're ready to crush some plates. Your bro knows how to motivate so that staying home is not an option unless you're injured. And even though you can shoot the shit, they still know when to get serious. If you're really lucky, you'll find one that doubles as a specialist or influencer. Sure, you could work out without these friends, but having someone nearby who's excited for your success and sad about your injuries is the best. Training becomes group therapy. 4. The Workhorse You need to see someone lifting heavier than you, going harder than you, and using better technique than you. You need this person, even if you don't talk to him or her very often. But here's the catch. Find a person whose abilities aren't so far out of reach that they seem impossible to accomplish. Make your workhorse someone who is maybe just a year or two more advanced than you, or just a level up in skill and strength. 
If you catch up to this person, then find a new workhorse to watch. Having one of these gives you something realistic to aim for. You raise your standards when you see someone doing better than you, but you also stay grounded, knowing that this person didn't get there overnight, and he or she is still improving from workout to workout, just like you. 5. The Reliable Source of Varied Info Everyone needs exposure to ideas, but it would be dangerous to trust just one person in this case, especially in fitness, where there tends to be a lot of self-proclaimed experts. That's where T Nation and other websites come in. You choose from a variety of people who have a variety of perspectives. Then you gather insight from whomever speaks to you, gives you applicable information, challenges your beliefs, and keeps you excited about training. You weigh the pros and cons of what they recommend, test things out, and think for yourself. Remember, no one person can contrive your exact set of circumstances, your goals, your experience level or skill level, finances, preferences, or genetic profile. So it's up to you to search for answers and find out for yourself how they apply to you. Well, I think that's pretty good advice in general. Uh, the one about criticism really struck home with me because I can think of many instances in my life when criticism, both kind and mean, really helped me to motivate myself to get better. And as I've heard many people say, hearing great job feels good, but never taught me anything. So anyway, next up to comment on this article and maybe add a few more observations of his own is Dave Pulsanella. So stand by for Dave's segment. So now I have my brother Dave Pulsanella with me uh, via Skype to talk a little bit about the article I just read, The Five People You Need to Avoid at the Gym. And five, five people every lifter needs to avoid is the actual name of the, the article. But we're going to widen it out a little bit, just the five people you need to avoid at the gym and people that you need to latch on to at the gym. Dave, are you there? Is it is it okay if I'm drunk? <laughs> You're always drunk when we do this. That makes it better. That's why I get drunk. I get drunk <laughs> to make it better. I'm sticking to that story. <laughs> How's everything been going with you? I'm like a curmudgeon, like a grumpy old curmudgeon now. <laughs> ah, I got my bad legs. Ah, fucking drink about it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Everything's good. That's cool. Hey, did I tell you uh, that I'm um, I'm moving? Yeah, dude. What happened there? I we, just... you know, uh, I moved in with my girlfriend Lynn, and we moved to Jersey City because we thought it'd be a nice location for both of us to commute to our jobs, which is in hers is in New York, and mine's up in West Caldwell. And it turned out to be a nightmare. The apartment is terrible, and the neighborhood is terrible, and. We found a great place. We're moving to Montclair, which is a beautiful community in New Jersey. Uh, and it couldn't have come at a better time because a few weeks ago, there was a dead body on the sidewalk up the street from us. <laughs> that ups the property values. I couldn't believe it. I came out. It was a Saturday morning. I came out to walk the dog. Uh, and I, I, I usually walk it pretty early on a Saturday morning, but we slept in that morning. If I hadn't slept in, I would have been the one probably to stumble across this body. It was at the other end of our, our street, and but it turned out that the guy at the end of the street had a fight with his girlfriend. He killed her, somehow beat her to death or stabbed her, I'm not even sure what, and then just dumped her, like out with the trash on the sidewalk. Wow. Yeah. And this like is there, that's done. So let's see uh, what's next. I'll what, did he, what did he think was going to happen next? She wasn't even like well wrapped up or anything. It was ridiculous. So you know, okay, this is this is now trash. It was horrific. Trash men come. They'll just take it, and then it'll be over, and I can go on with my life. That just shows how how much of a, a crime of passion it was. Obviously, you know, because he didn't even think it through. Because if you were if you were calculating how to do this, how to kill somebody, you would have gotten rid of it, rid of the body. Instead, he just threw her out the door. Unbelievable! And we're like, thank God, we're getting out of here. One one week from today, from as of yeah, but you know that could happen anywhere. You know that. Not like that. I don't know about like that. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like Jersey City bullshit to me. Wow. So isn't there a way that you can go on some kind of app and see, uh, before you move into a neighborhood, see the crime level, see uh, the, uh, the socioeconomic level, just all the stats 
about where you're going to move. I know that exists. Right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we didn't do that. Yeah, you didn't do that. Okay. No, we didn't. Just do that. checking. <laughs> <laughs> This place sounds good. It's got a lot of vowels in it, you know. <laughs> so, the street numbers one way and president's names the other way. It sounds really good to me. Well, we moved into this place because it had a, an elevator for the old dog who can't go up downstairs anymore. And there was other reasons we moved here, but it just turned out to be a nightmare. So we moved in last September. It's uh, May now, and we're, we're getting out. Getting out and moving to Montclair. And that was a short stint. Yeah, seriously. But uh, I thought you would find that interesting. Uh, yeah, that's any- awful, actually. And especially from a fan of Investigation Discovery, as myself. It's really terrible. I mean, all you know, the cops were swarming at the end of the street. And so when I walked the dog that morning, I was like, I'm not even going to go down there. And there's like this tent. Like, what is this? It's like a fundraiser? It's like a carnival or something? No, no. They had a tent over the poor woman. You know, to to do forensics without people, you know, you know, gathering around and watching. You know what's awful? Like you and I are brothers, and we have so much in common, and yet we are so different at the same time. Which is why <laughs> I think we get along so much. But, dude, you're like talking about how horrendous this is. I can't believe I'm so close to finding it. That could have been me finding it. <laughs> and I'm like, that's all I wish is that someday I find a dead body. I like, dude. I watch Investigation Discovery. I'm like, oh, man, I would love to find a body. I'd love to be the one that comes upon like a fucking body somewhere. It's like, wow, I get to call the cops and be the one to point, look, a body. You're like, oh, this is the most horrendous thing I can imagine in my life. I found a I almost, I, I was 10 people away from finding a body. <laughs> so we're like so different. You would have had to have sat there with it while the cops came. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I don't know. It's just one of those. You know what it is? It's just the way I am and how I think and how my life needs to be like this crazy ride. Yeah. You know, that would be a definite part of a crazy ride. It's like something that just doesn't happen. The other thing that I always wanted to see is a huge jetliner oh. crashing right in front of me. Just oh. crashing, devastating fireballs and people in, still in their seats being thrown. I don't know why. I don't want that to happen to anyone. I just want to see it. Would a gasoline tanker truck blowing up uh, 10 cars in front of you do for you there? I would accept that. I would accept that. I would settle for, I would settle for that. Sure. Oh. Or a car flipping 17 times over a median. Oh, I saw that. I saw that. By the way, I was on I-95 uh, in Folsom, down near where Dad lives, and I was, I was traveling south, and there was this SUV traveling north. This was a couple of years ago, and it I don't know what it did. It swerved or it hit something, and it started to roll across all of the lanes towards me, like right towards me. There was nothing I could do. I was surrounded by cars. And I was watching it come. It hit the, it hit the, there was like a concrete divider. It went up and then, then back down into its original lane. Wow. If it had, if it had flipped over, it would have sure. been right in, in front of me or on me. And there was right. nothing. It's one of those moments where it's like, that, that's it's just your, your time. time and there's nothing you can yeah. do. Like the guy getting hit in the back of the head with the tire. <laughs> yes, I saw that. That's so that. random. And it's like, dude, the thing is traveling at 100 miles an hour. And it goes right to his head. That's why I stay alert at all times. And I'm constantly <laughs> looking around. I'm looking for something to come out Honestly, of nowhere. Dude, that could have easily happened to you. Of course. You walk down the street just like he does. I, <laughs> I always say to myself, stay alert. You know, especially when driving. Stay alert because anything can happen at any time. And then when something does happen, I'm always caught off guard. I'm like, fuck, why was I thinking about my dinner that night? There is no, yeah, exactly. There is no amount of alert that could have prevented me from driving down 95 one night and a block of ice the size of a cinder block just crashed through my windshield from somewhere. It either fell off a plane or it came off of a truck and then flew up and then landed on, it landed directly where my face is. Luckily, it did. Did it, did it come right. through the windshield or just break it? <laughs> Luckily, it's that kind of glass that just like... Yeah. Kind of like feathers. Yeah. A plastic in it. So it completely shattered the windshield and made like a little hole. But if it was regular glass, it would have beheaded me. 
it was the kind of thing where it was like a cinder block going at 30 miles an hour coming towards me and I was going 30 miles an hour in the opposite direction. So it was going 60 miles an hour. Why so when the... Why, when the head is separated from the body, do we call it beheaded? It's also being bebodied. That's true, but bebodied sounds really stupid. <laughs> de bodied. De bodied. De- <laughs> it's being it de-bodied. debodied. My head was completely debodied. Right. And so I'm. I'm a, I assume it would have debodied me if it had come through the windshield, but right. So I had to pull a um, a uh, Ace Ventura pet detective. Which means? And I decided I was going to drive home with a completely shattered windshield by sticking my head out the driver's side window. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. Oh, all right. So anyway, this podcast is supposed to be about bodybuilding and fitness and oh, gym stuff. Okay. So let's let's get to it. Are we, I, like you, I said, I did you and the skinny brother end up with a bodybuilding podcast. <laughs> I see that all the time. I'm like, dude, the, 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 my, the, my brother who never lifted. I had to drag you downstairs to lift that. Drag you by your hands and feet down to the basement to, to work out when we were kids. And now you have like, you know, your bodybuilding GVD series. <laughs> and you have your bodybuilding podcast. Who the fuck put you in charge? <laughs> First of all, <laughs> I'm not skinny. I'm not that skinny. You're lying. And, and second of all, this is this is me making opportunities for myself because I always wanted to be a voiceover guy, and it's impossible to break into yeah. voiceover. So I found out. So I figured I'll just do it myself. And so I, you know, I did the the uh, the videos, which was really just an excuse to do the voiceover. And now I'm doing a podcast. Unfortunately, everybody's doing a podcast. Literally, everybody has a podcast. Yep, they do. They do. They're very, very, very popular. Yeah. I mean, very, very common, I should say, not popular. But, you know, you got to look at listenership. How many of these podcasts are actually good? How many of them are actually, like, really well-known? How many are listened to? Yeah. Very, I just listen to myself talking. <laughs> very few. Very you know? Few. Seriously. But we better get to the reason we're here or else we're going to lose our listeners, too. <laughs> we're never going to lose the listeners. But go ahead. <laughs> How can, you lose, how can you lose something you don't have? Oh, my COPD. <laughs> oh. uh, this, the article that I read by Danny Shugart uh, I thought was really good. And it's funny because number three, the outdated expert, reminds me of this guy that I see at the gym all the time. I want to call him like an old guy, but he's, he's about my age. He's in his 50s. Okay. And he's literally doing, I can tell, he's doing the stuff that his football coach <laughs> taught him in high school. He it's runs. Stuck he ru- it's stuck there. He runs sideways down across the uh, the gym. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, that kind yeah, of like fancy footwork sideways thing. Yeah. And then he Dude, comes back. That may or may not be him doing the stuff his football coach told him. Everybody does that now. And the other thing everyone does is, is walk sideways across the gym with a rubber band around their knees. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Uh, yeah, but everything this guy does is ineffective. You might be right. And seemingly out of date. Uh, he, he's one of those guys that puts way too much weight on the leg press machine and then does eighth reps with it. You know? One of those guys. Everybody does that. <laughs> that is now how the leg press is used. Uh, and he does all this functional stuff that and he just looks like crap. He just looks terrible. And I just think he needs uh, he just yeah. needs somebody to shake him up and, and, and give him a, a new program. Well, he stopped learning at high, in high school. It's like yeah. he, he absorbed that information from his yeah. coach. Like, this is what you do. Yeah. Just uh, like Timmy, Timmy uh, still, when he goes on his diet, he'll still eat tuna and ultra fuel. What's ultra fuel? Dude, ultra fuel is a, a, a fruity carb oh. beverage that was that was around in the eighties. Oh. And they still sell it. And he remembered that me and Kenny in a pinch oh. would just pop a can of tuna and for the carb we'd give we'd do an ultra fuel. So like Timmy's like, you know, three weeks ago, whew, back on tuna and ultra fuel. I'm like, Timmy is tuna and ultra fuel. Come on. First of all, for people that don't know, Tim Covert is in Raising the Bar 2. He's he's a real character, but but he has never been ripped in his life, or has he? No, he did a show once. Don't you remember? 
Oh, that was a long time ago. Kenny and I got him ready for a show, and while he was far from ripped, <laughs> because he only cut the beer out two weeks out of the show, <laughs> which right. for him was an amazing sacrifice. Right, this is a guy who gets most of his nutrition through beer. Correct. That's all, all of his nutrition. He was like, I cut beer out two weeks before that show. Do you know what that was like for me? He wasn't <laughs> draw, dude. But you know, he wanted to do well. I think he wanted to do well at the show for me and for Kenny. Yeah. But he was far from ripped. It was the best he ever looked, though. He actually had some ablets on him. <laughs> Little ab buds. So he's going to get back there again, drinking the Ultra Fuel. Tuna Ultra Fuel, baby. Oh my God. Why is he? What's he trying to get ripped for? He's not. I just made that completely up. Oh. So, uh, he hasn't talked about tuna and Ultra Fuel in probably a decade. But, but if podcast, we gotta have we gotta entertain people. But if he was going to, that's what he would use. He would do that, yeah, because that's he locked into that piece of information. He did that with a lot of things, you know. Um, when when Simi and I or Kenny and I were his mentors, and he just locked into a lot of things. They they still serve him, but um, yeah, he's like doesn't he hasn't learned since then anything. Do you do you see that a lot in your gym with people using outdated uh, methods? I see people doing not outdated stuff in as much as they're doing trendy stuff. No, the opposite. Like ab walk and all, all that fancy shuffle footwork stuff. And, you know, everything's got to have a ball or a rope or, a, you know, there's these movements. They're all combo movements where you're doing like four different things all half assed at the same time. <laughs> a lunge into a forward raise into a shoulder press back down into a squat over to a leg raise to a plie into a somersault into a jack a, a, a jumping jack you know that's one rep right i mean so that, these, these things are trendy and and they're not i'm not saying they're bad but this is you know everyone's doing these things this is what everyone's doing so that fancy footwork thing is is new because it looked like like I'm old not saying football it's work new. it is football work i'm not saying it's new but you didn't see, you know, twenty people in the gym in one day doing it ten years ago. Now you do, and, and it wouldn't be so bad if this guy actually looked good or was strong. He's neither of those things. But he doesn't see the connection between what he's doing and the ineffectiveness of it, does he? Right. What he thinks is, I just need to do more of it, and I'll get back to where I was in 1985. <laughs> I'll be 18. I'll be 18 again. I'm coming back, baby. I'm coming back. Here, there's, there's one. That's, that's a, that's a gym person that I can't stand. Is the person who is always coming back. Oh, they're never, they're never there. Go? They're always and coming back. You're there. <laughs> you are never there. That happens to me at bars all the fucking time. Every time I'm just sitting there minding my own business, someone double fist and it will come up to me. Oh. Dude, dude, you jacked, man. Like, yeah, okay. You, you got to get me right. They always say that same sentence. Dude, you got to get me right. I was so into it. You know, I just let myself go. And he's like drinking. Seriously, they're always, they have a drink in both hands every time. <laughs> so you got to get, I'm like, I don't have to do anything but be here without you in my face. So they're always like, you got to get me, like, you give me your, do you have a card? And I'm like, no, and you would not remember me handing it to you if I did. <laughs> you inspired me, man. Now I'm 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 getting back into it. Now I'm getting you're back into it because of met me tomorrow night or tomorrow morning. You're gonna forget you even met me. So inspiring. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah, yeah. The guys that are always coming back. Uh, another one from the article is the is the what they call the public speaker, which is the person who cannot tell a short story and also can't tell the social cues when you're trying to start your set and need to concentrate. I here's another here's somebody just popped in my head, the seminar giver. There's <sighs> always some mediocrely built guy with like moderate level of knowledge, maybe one or two years in in the game. Who was on the gym floor spouting off information in seminar fashion, like two or three clueless people who are looking uh, up. Uh, Have you ever seen it? Yes. Here's Which my variation of that. It's an opportunity right after your workout to take in fast acting proteins. So you want to get them in within 30 to 60 seconds of your workout. If you don't, you've wasted your complete workout. You know, things like that. And they're like taking notes. Here's here's my version of that the one that I've seen and saw just recently is, I call it the boyfriend 
who doesn't know anything but needs his girlfriend to think he does. Oh, like the story I told in my book about the guy loading up the leg press for his girlfriend. Oh, that's and right. Loading that's up the plates on the plate holder. Yes. And not the machine itself. <laughs> that guy. Yeah, I saw a guy putting his girlfriend through everything wrong. Just everything ineffective, wrong movements, dangerous movements. He didn't know what he was doing, and he was teaching her exactly the same thing. But to her, he's the expert. Uh, and, and, and what's going to happen is she's going to, be, going to become frustrated or pull a muscle or something or just, just right. not have any, uh, any results and quit. Uh, Pretty much. One of those things. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about uh, another trend that I really hate right now that's going on. It's in my gym. I don't know if it's in any other gyms, but I have my office right there on the gym floor, as you know. Um, and like groups of four or five people will be will be getting together in the gym to work out and to do those kind of movement workouts, you know, all over the place uh, where they're kind of working out like they're doing the monkey bars and they're doing, uh, you know, com- combination movements. The but, monkey bars. They know what it calls oh, them. There's the monkey, monkey bars in my gym. There's monkey bars and there's rings. Monkey bars are from the playground, right? Yeah. yeah that's funny. There's a whole like a universal setup. Yeah. That has like dip station and all kinds of different stations and monkey bars. And they're always on the monkey bars. But the thing that bothers me the most is that they now, they have this little thing that's maybe the size of a, a cigarette pack, right? Yeah. But it's like a, a little boom box that delivers loud ass sound really good sound and they put it on oh. the middle of the gym with like the worst gangster rap music you can imagine you know put it the fridge, little motherfucker, little fun, little fun, really loud and it drowns out the gym music completely or it becomes cacophony with the gym music but usually drowns it out completely, and they're own, they're own, they're in their own little zone there in the middle of a public gym, where if you don't like that music, you're offended by it. Too fucking mad. No, forget about the kind of music. No, I saw this. This happened at my gym recently, and I fucking had to leave because it didn't drown out the music over the loudspeakers. It didn't drown out the TVs, which were all on around the room. So you had. TVs on three or four different channels, plus the music coming through the speakers, plus this shit, all at the same time. It was impossible to stay in that room and be, and stay sane. Well, what bothers me is nobody shuts it down. It nobody should be shut down. Comes over and, and says anything ever. I mean, think about it. Think about it. You theoretically, if you wanted to do that, you should ask everyone. Hey. You know, do you, would you mind hearing it? Would you mind hearing this? Would you like to hear this? And get None a consensus. No, I'm just fucking going to do it. They just do it. As if we should all have... It, it, it's 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 incredible to me. It's incredible. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen what you're talking about. Yeah. So they've been doing that a lot right outside my door too. And the, and the other thing is it's right outside my door. So if I have like a, a prospective client who's come from a different gym and they're sitting in my office, I'm trying to like close a deal. Yeah. And there's that, you know, that really awful gangsta rap ghetto shit blaring right outside my door that doesn't that's not good for business why don't p- the people at the front desk shut that down the people at the front desk are 21 the owner's never there the manager is never there so it's basically a bunch of kids running the front desk and they're probably intimidated getting paid minimum wage so they don't care why should they have to the only the only way they're going to get into a conflict is if another uh, member complains or if a, a superior made them go over and do right, it right that's not going to happen so now they're not, not no, sure. they're going to take the path of least resistance of course pretty much the other guy I hate in the fucking gym is because they always bother me because hmm. obviously I look like an experienced lifter so they're going to they're going to ask me is the too heavy spotter guy <laughs> The guy who you can look at him and tell he cannot bench 315, and yet 315 is on the bar, and he's looking around the gym Mm. for the spot. Right. Eyes lock on me, and I tell the spot, dude, can you give me a spot? 
which basically means, can you watch this barbell crash onto my sternum and then deadlift it off of me three times? You put your back and shoulders at an uncomfortably dangerous angle right. to try to lift this thing off of right. my chest before I die and possibly throw your back out. Well, that's what it is for me because In my lower back. Invariably, the bar drops as if there was nothing resisting it, as if you just dropped it in free space. <laughs> onto his chest and then it is your job to pull it off now you think he'd rack it at that point realizing whoo this is about 150 pounds too heavy no goes for another two reps <laughs> that i have to pull even more off of the second and third time i'm basically sideways deadlifting 315 so that's my contribution to that article <laughs> what about what about the the positive people that you should be around i actually have a good example of this, the kind of people that you want to be around at the gym. Mm -hmm. um, and this actually relates to something you and I were talking about recently with our cousin Steve, who has a strength gym, like a powerlifting strongman gym. Mm -hmm. And he's been kind of promoting it recently, I think, and, and I think you agree with me, in the wrong way. Oh, he's yeah. Promoting it as sort of like, um, you know, we're badass kind of this kind of thing like if do you remember any of the ads that he put yeah, out recently? I remember what he said it's like you know if you're if you're not here to build strength stay home they, they all rhymed though they were like little little clever rhymes right you know you're a pussy if you don't do this you, you know right. he basically sets it up to be intimidating to 99.9 percent .9 of the population and appealing to the other people now obviously he wants to draw more people in than just the strength athletes. And this is, you know, he's going about it the wrong way, I think. The truth of the matter is, now here's the thing, though. The truth of the matter is, is he's wrong. Because I've trained at his gym. And it is incredibly inspiring to be around. Now, the gym has, it's it's split. You know, there's kind of like the strength section with the platforms and the stones and the, and the racks. And then there's, you know, the regular weights and machines on the other side. So a person like me, a regular person who just wants to stay fit, I can work out and not get in the way of the big guys, but I'm near them. And that stuff that's going on is really exciting and expiring. And, you know, watch them lifting all this weight. I think it rubs off on you. Not to mention the fact that these guys, almost to a person that I've met, have been the nicest, smartest guys who are also willing to help anyone in the mm -hmm. gym. Most of them are really great, nice guys, not intimidating at all. And I think he's misrepresenting the entire atmosphere of the place. Yeah, it's a place where an average person like me should want to go. And I, I, I do like working out there around these people. Yeah, but you'd never know it by listening to him talk and, and from his advertisements. Right. So, but I think he thinks at this point that he has this persona that he has to stick with and live up to. Yeah, but and my point is, is, is to encourage people – Go to strength those strength gyms and work out around these guys. You'll find out that they're amazing, they're smart, they're knowledgeable, and you'll be inspired to do better than you've ever done before. The problem is he he gears those ads towards the ten people who already work out at that gym, right. and what he knows they want to hear, and that will find funny. I know. That's what, he does. that's what he does. And unfortunately, that's going to keep all the other people away. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone else you can think of that, that you should gravitate to in the gym or, or a certain kind you of know, person that you should bring in as a training partner? It's funny. When I was, when I was coming up in the sport, it was very important to me to train with someone I looked up to mm -hmm. who was bigger than me, more advanced than me, and stronger than me. And um, who I respected in the sport. And when you're starting off, that's not too hard to find, you know. Yeah. You know, when you're when you're 12 and you're getting into bodybuilding, as I was, you walk into a gym of what would look like, to me now like like regular guys, but they looked the mammoth to me then. They were bodybuilders. If someone had a big tricep. I was in awe. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you're young. When I was a teenager, and when I joined my first gym. You know, I could be inspired by people. What happens, though, as you progress, if you make it far enough, I'm sure people at the elite level feel this. I'm sure, like, Kai Green 
looks around. It's like, who the fuck can I train with? Who's going to contribute anything? Right. As I got better and better and better at this, and I moved up the ranks, I met Kenny at such a perfect time in my life. It was the perfect storm. I was at a developmental stage where I was good, but I wasn't great. And he, while wasn't great, but he was at that next level for me. Yeah. So he would train for a show. His intensity was better than mine. It was. It just was. As hard as I trained, <laughs> his was better. Well, his intensity was better than everyone's because Everyone. he was insane. He's insane. He um he did more than other people were willing to do. His diet was tighter. And I saw all this stuff and it was it was what I wasn't. So I became it. I stepped up a notch and became it, right? Mm-hmm. So as I progressed and I became, you know, a, a national level guy, and then at the top of the national level, kind of knocking on the door of a pro card, it's funny, it becomes really, really hard to find a, a person in the gym or a training partner that's going to meet you on time. And that isn't just going to try to suck off of my energy. It became to the point where people were working out with me to follow my workouts, to suck up my energy, yeah. to benefit in my to get get caught in my slipstream, so to speak. You know what I mean? But where was that for me? Right. Where is that for someone like Kai? Where no. is that? Where are you going to find that? Sure, no. he's got constantly on a train with Kai. Yeah, you want to suck up his knowledge and his intensity. Uh, but who is he going to? Who's he going to train with? That's why he doesn't train with anybody. Like, Actually, Aaron's- he he does find people from time to time. Like he was training with that girl in uh, in the uh, Kai Green, A Day in the Life of the Bodybuilder, three part series that I did on YouTube on my Mike Polsonelli YouTube channel. Um, mm-hmm. And she, because she was intense, she had transformed her body and she had a lot of um, ambition, and she worked really really hard. Now, even though their strength levels were very different, it doesn't matter. He liked her intensity. You know, and you bring up a good point because people are always like, you know, I'm probably not strong enough or big enough to work out with you. And I would say, look, it doesn't matter to me if you're big. No. It doesn't matter to me if you're strong because I'm certainly not. It doesn't matter to me if you're a guy or a girl. Just have heart and show up on time. <laughs> right. Don't suck up my energy provide some Kenny provided so much energy you couldn't hold him back it was contagious like when but also contributed it right like when you and I used to train together huh like when you and I used to train together oh oh (laughs) oh really (laughs) Yeah, exactly. The intensity that I had to bring to the table to pull you down the steps by your teeth <laughs> was amazing. I wasn't into it then. No, you weren't. And I had no training partner. I had no choice other than to take you in that basement and force you to work out with me. It was awful. Why didn't you train with dad at that point? He was still into it. I just, I don't know. He never trained with me. He would write up all my workouts. Yeah. I don't know why we didn't work out together. I don't think I couldn't picture him going down there with me. No. What was he I, doing at that time? He was sitting there. <laughs> well, I wanted looking, to sit there too. Yeah. He's sitting there. Yeah, I know. Everybody was just sitting there when I was down in the basement doing squats. Doing oh, I remember though. I remember how frustrated you used to get because you would try to get you know the sleep that a bodybuilder needs. And Dad and I used to like to watch uh, Benny Hill at every night, which came on at like 11 or 11.30. So I wouldn't be coming up. And this is back when we all lived. We were kids and we all lived in the same house. So you and I are sharing a bedroom. Yeah. And I'm, you're getting to, going to bed at like 9 o'clock. And I'm not coming to bed till like 11.30, 12 o'clock. And, oh. pop, and waking you up as I walked in and screwing up your recovery rest. And I just remember watching Benny Hill with Dad. And you come into the top of the stairs like, come on, come to bed. I'm like, I don't want to. I want to watch Benny Hill. <laughs> oh, my God. You're screwing me up, dude. I could have turned pro if it wasn't for you. Right. It's all my fault. It's all about you. The funny thing is, 
is that this this old dog that, that I now live with, with you know mm-hmm. Lynn's dog, does the same thing. She's old and she wants to go to bed earlier than we do. So she starts pacing. Uh, she's just, you know, these big, big jowls, dripping saliva. And, she's like, uh, and she looks at you. And she starts pacing. Uh, she looks at you. And then she like goes and she lays in her bed. Bedroom's like right next to the living room. I can see her. And she looks from her bed. <laughs> it's the same thing. Oh, my it's God. Yeah, I'm exact- not old with jowls. Well, I wasn't then. <laughs> no. uh, it just reminds me of that time. That's all. I forgot that section of my life, but yeah, fuck you, dude. Well, that was the same section in which, now remember, you know, we're sharing this tiny little bedroom in a tiny little house in Southwest Philly in a working class neighborhood, and we were still, we were almost adults sleeping in bunk beds, right? <laughs> that's because that's all we had. There was not enough room in the in the bedroom for two full beds, and we right. had to share. And you're on the top trying to bulk up eating chicken breasts and, and apples and God knows what else. And the There's chicken bones ch- and apple cores are falling through the slats in the bed onto my head in the middle of the night. <laughs> because I would eat in bed and then I would just put it Why? in the remember that little shelf that was right above your head. Yes, I do. And Why were you eating in bed? I don't know. You're so weird. I remember, I remember dad told me, if you want to get big... You have to just constantly eat, but not move that much. <laughs> That's what he told me. Because the only time you move is when you work out. So I figured eating while laying in bed, which is the ultimate in not moving, would lead to the best gains. <laughs> you had some really ridiculous theories, like the one that we talk about in Raising the Bar 1, where you have to drink your protein shake all one, at once. Mm-hmm, one or, breath. Or it doesn't work. Why? Why? The entire, I had to take the entire blender and just do it. Where did that just come from? Slow. Where did I come from? Yes. A twisted, demented mind. Oh. I don't know. I still do that. You're ridiculous. When I get them, when I get them working out and I have that uh, shake. Yeah. I just, <laughs> just get in. Mm. I, I still tend to try to do that, but then I stop myself. I think, hey, you don't have to drink it that way. Enjoy it. <laughs> I poisoned your mind with that. You really did. Uh, that's a shame. Uh, anyway, all right, let's 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 wrap this one up. We got a little off the off the track, but uh, those are the people you should hang out with at the gym and the people you shouldn't hang out with at the gym for whatever, if that helps you. I don't know. Um, so next time we're going to talk about haters and possibly do some Q&A questions for chat for uh, episode 12 that was redundant <laughs> why was that redundant <laughs> what was redundant about that question and answer questions did i say that yeah just oh that's ask. like that's like pin that's like atm machine and pin yes, number it's like atm machines <laughs> all right say question and answers all right i'll try not to be redundant in the next episode of voices right. of fitness and bodybuilding What is this thing we call love? What are the elusive elements that constitute attraction? It's not all looks. It can't be, because I'm sure we've all experienced a surprising attraction to someone who we might not otherwise think is physically attractive, and the converse, that strange moment when we realize that we aren't attracted to someone who in most respects seems like a perfect mate on paper. It can be frustrating and confusing, and sometimes physical attraction without true compatibility can keep us in bad relationships. But when you get it all right, when it all comes together, it's bliss. So what is that indefinable something? This next article attempts to outline the major factors of attraction. From the website mindbodygreen.com, this is an article called The Science of Attraction, This is what determines whether you have chemistry or not. By Don Maslar, and this was posted November 28, 2016. Jessica met Michael online. She was enamored of his picture, and after several emails, they finally decided to meet at a trendy coffee shop in Jessica's neighborhood. 
She was so excited. It's all she talked about for three days prior. Finally, the day came. Michael walked through the glass door, and Jessica's heart sank. He looked like his picture, but something seemed to change for Jessica. Unfortunately, all those butterflies she had been feeling for the previous three days seemed to just fly away. When people meet on a first date, they are usually looking for that buzz, that feeling of having chemistry. But what causes that feeling? What causes your body to react? Well, several things, it turns out. Attraction is actually voted on by a committee. Each of your senses has the opportunity to cast a vote. Your eyes, nose, ears, and even your skin can help decide if this person does it for you or not. 1. The weightiest vote comes from the eyes, especially for men. Men have 25% more neurons in their visual cortices. That's why they tend to place more emphasis on visual cues. But of course, both men and women are drawn to indications of sexual health, such as shiny hair, clear skin, bright eyes, and a fit body. Interestingly, research has also found that if we had positive childhood experiences, we're more likely to be attracted to individuals who have similar characteristics to our opposite sex parent. One study found that people were able to successfully pick out a photo of a woman's husband based on pictures of her father. 2. The nose also has a vote. Women can sense major histocompatibility complex molecules, or MHC. These are proteins emitted into the air that indicate a person's immune system. Studies have found that women are more attracted to men with opposite immune systems, meaning complementary antibodies. Now this makes biological sense. If a child were born from the union, that child would have a wider variety of immune cells and potentially a healthier immune system. And for the record, I don't think that just women can sense histocompatibility. Uh, I think men sense that too, I, but I don't think they've done studies on, on that exactly. And we'll get to a little bit more about that later. Three, at the same time, both men and women sense pheromones. Women are attracted to metabolites of testosterone, an indicator of a man's strength and vitality. Men are attracted to copulins, a pheromone that a woman produces during ovulation, which means men are most attracted to women during peak fertility. 4. The ears are listening to the other's voice. A man tends to be most attracted to higher-pitched voices. A woman is most attracted to a deep voice. Research has found that the deeper a man's voice is, the more likely a woman is to remember him. Maybe that's why you just can't seem to forget those Barry White songs. Hmm, baby. That's right, baby. 5. Your environment has a major impact on attraction as well. What you hold in your hand can influence how you feel about someone. One study found that when participants held a cup of hot coffee in their hands, they judged the person as warmer and more generous. When the same participants held an iced coffee instead, they judged that same person as colder and more stoic. But it's not just your hands that can vote. Your butt can too. Sitting on a warm, fluffy couch will make you warm up to a person faster than sitting on a cold, stiff, plastic chair. And six, finally, if all your senses are in agreement, one moment gets the final say, the first kiss. This kiss is a mixture of smell, texture, and taste that has the ability to make or break a relationship. In a recent Gallup poll, the pollsters discovered that 59% of men and 66% of women had broken off a new relationship because of a bad first kiss. And that's the bad news. The good news is that if someone passes the first kiss test, chances are there will be more really good kisses in the future. So all of those elements are important, of course, but I want to draw your attention to two of them, the chemical ones. These are the components of attraction that I think are too often overlooked or ignored, and yet I think these may be the most important of all, at least in my experience. The first is the search for pheromones. We know that some insects and animals send chemicals into the air to attract mates, 
And scientists have been trying for some time to discover if human beings are doing that too. And they seem to be getting close to a conclusion. But is the answer yes or no? Well, let's see. This comes from smithsonian.com. And it's called The Truth About Pheromones by Sarah Everts. Posted March of 2012. The sight of someone in tears might make you feel concerned, but the smell of tears, researchers say, has a different effect. Quote, you might think, and we did, that smelling tears might create empathy, says Noam Sobel, a neurobiologist at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. He and his colleagues had women watch a sad movie scene, collected their tears, and placed samples of the unidentified fluid under men's noses. The tears did not elicit empathy in a standard lab test, but they did reduce the men's sexual arousal and testosterone levels. Apparently, the tears sent a message that romance was off the table. This study offers some of the most recent evidence that people perceive all sorts of interesting things about one another through olfaction. Airborne molecules that elicit a reaction in a member of the same species are called pheromones, and the most famous ones are potent aphrodisiacs like androstenone and androstenol in the saliva of male boars. If a fertile female gets a whiff of these molecules, she'll present her rear to the male, a universal gesture in wild pig patois that means, let's start a family. And I would say for most mammals as well, including humans. Researchers as well as fragrance companies, have been hoping to find a human sex pheromone for decades. But so far, the search has failed, says George Pretty of the Monell Chemical Senses Center in Philadelphia. Quote, that doesn't mean a human sex pheromone doesn't exist, Pretty is quick to add. It just means we haven't found one yet, end quote. In fact, some researchers suspect that if there is a turn-off pheromone, as Sobel's team says, there's likely to be a turn-on pheromone. In one 2005 study, gay men given anonymous samples of sweat preferred the sweat of gay men, and heterosexual men fancied the scent of women. One's nose can also help identify a genetically compatible mate. Researchers asked women to rate the odors of t-shirts worn by different men. Women preferred men whose DNA was different enough from their own that it would increase the likelihood of producing a child with a robust immune system. Newborns preferentially scoot toward the scent of breasts. An adult can often tell by smell whether the person who produced perspiration was anxious or not. The search for human pheromones has been hampered by two obstacles. First, quote, the effects we see are not dramatic. Sobel says. Instead, Pretty says, our responses to odors are, quote, confounded by other sensory inputs like sight and sound, past experiences, learning, context, not to mention laws, end quote. Second, nobody has been able to find the exact chemicals that cue people about anxiety, mating compatibility, or breast milk. This may be because researchers have traditionally analyzed aromatics from armpits. The fact is, any bodily fluid could potentially harbor pheromones, which is why Sobel studied tears of sadness. And who knows what signals are lurking in tears of joy. So it kind of seems that whether or not we actually have pheromones is still up in the air. But there is definitely a smell component to attraction. And it may have developed as a very important evolutionary adaptation, which we've heard about two times already. And I want to dive into that a little deeper and read uh, one more article for you. Now, this is really fascinating to me. And this is kind of where I've been leading you with all of these articles uh, to this one particular point. The article is called Gene Research Finds Opposites Do Attract. And this is from TheGuardian.com, written by Ian Sample and posted in May of 2009. The bond of true love may be forged in the genes as well as in the mind, researchers have found. A comparative survey of couples suggests people are more attracted to those who have very different immunity genes from their own, even though they are not aware of it. The genes in question play a major role in the immune system's ability to fight infections, but they are also thought to leave a lingering trace in the scent of people's body odor. 
the scientist who led the study, believes humans have evolved to sniff out partners who have different immunity genes because they tend to produce healthier children with stronger immune systems. Quote, It may be tempting to think that humans choose their partners because of their similarities, said Maria de Graca Bicaljo, a professor of immunology at the University of Panama in Brazil. Quote, but our research has shown clearly that it is the differences that make for successful reproduction and that the subconscious drive to have healthy children is important when choosing a mate, end quote. Picalho's team looked at a group of genes known as the Major Histocompatibility Complex, MHC, and noted down how much the genes varied between 90 married couples and 152 fictitious couples paired up at random by a computer. Quote, if MHC genes did not influence mate selection, we would have expected to see similar results for both set of couples, said Bicalho. Quote, but we found that the real partners had significantly more MHC dissimilarities than we could have expected to find simply by chance. End quote. The MHC region is made up of a large number of genes on chromosome 6 and has been found in most vertebrates. As well as being linked to immunity, the group of genes are also thought to play a role in fertility. The flip side of the study suggests that humans have evolved to find people with similar immunity genes unappealing. This would have the effect of reducing inbreeding, which can have serious medical consequences for a couple's children. Earlier studies have shown that couples with similar MHC genes have children further apart, which might be due to the women having more early-stage miscarriages that go undetected. Quote, We expect to find that cultural aspects play an important role in mate choice and certainly do not subscribe to the theory that if a person bears a particular genetic variant, it will determine his or her behavior, said Bicalho. Quote, but we also think that the unconscious, evolutionary aspect of partner choice should not be overlooked. Our research shows that this has an important role to play in ensuring healthy reproduction by helping to ensure that children are born with a strong immune system, better able to cope with infection. Well, that's just amazing to me. We've evolved to actually sniff out those who are too much the same as us genetically speaking. And kissing gives us a chance to get in close and get a really good sniff or even a taste. I just think that a lot of people aren't aware of the chemical aspect of attraction or sometimes try to ignore it because they are uncomfortable accepting the fact that we are really just still animals. But I think it's something to be aware of because it, it's often a factor that can drive you, again, as I said, to, to stay in bad relationships. And the more we are aware of the unconscious aspects of attraction, I think the better we'll be able to make mate choices, really. So I guess the lesson is don't ignore your nose when it comes to picking a mate. Or better yet, don't let only your nose drive you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Voices of Fitness and Bodybuilding. If you like what you hear, please share. Tell your friends about us. Help us spread the word. And if you listen on iTunes, please rate the show. That really helps us too. Or you can subscribe on YouTube to my channel if that works for you. And you can always find us on SoundCloud as well. There are lots of ways to listen. Just a reminder that you can send me articles to be considered for this podcast at mike at mikepulsanella.com. They can be articles you find or pieces you write yourself. So till next time, stay active and stay healthy.